Okay, back to our program and our class. <laughs> okay, so uh, what is the Eightfold Path? You know, Buddha said in the Four Great Vows, there's a path. So what is the path? Got to watch my time here. Um, very quickly, <laughs> right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right meditation or practice. So today we're talking about view. Actually, uh, two things really fundamental if you want to uh, make use of Buddha's teaching. One is this direction. I want to help all beings. I want to get out of suffering. I want to help all beings get out of suffering. It's your direction. Don't worry about arrive, not arrive, go. You know? And the second is we develop a correct view. Correct view. If we keep um, our view based on uh, prejudices, we'll never see things clearly. So I'm giving you some of basic, Buddha's basic teachings that help you even look at your own little matrix in your brain that you're using to um, uh, interpret or uh, that is causing, that is forming your perceptions of just what comes in. Uh, because uh, I have found they're very useful and uh, again, check it out seems to be based on the way things really are. And, uh, you know, this is Theravadan teaching. They really break it down, these eight, eight things. And some people are very interested in that and try to work on one or the other. So, uh, you know, you decide as you live your life and do your practice um, whether this kind of teaching helps you. Um, I just figured, uh, uh, for me, a uh, right view and uh, try to... Uh, understand how I make my own suffering, overcome it, and help others overcome theirs, and along the way, the other ones will all work out. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't get into all the details when I try and live my life. But in any case, Sun Sun Sanin said, right, what is right view? No view. No view. That means you can see truth. Sky's blue. Daytime, sky's blue. That's it. You know, if you're a farmer and you need rain, it's a bummer. If you're going on a picnic, you're happy. But the truth is, the sky is blue. You know, America and um, something came into America, and all lots of young people became interested in his teaching, and we made Zen centers and practice, and people had jobs, and some people had families, but many people lived together in a Zen center. And right away, the East Coast Zen centers and the West Coast Zen centers started fighting each other. <laughs> And none of us could understand what's going on. Why is it like that? And Sansanin, very easy. We asked him, and he said, West Coast people have many opinions, but they don't hold them strongly. East Coast people have very few opinions, but they hold them very strongly. And, it, and we were all just kind of stopped short, like, oh. He didn't say one is better, one is worse. He just saw exactly how we were, and that's that. You know, how are you going to use it? That's all. He didn't know, oh, they've got to change, they've got to change, or they're wrong, they're wrong. Not at all. If you apply that to your life, my boss says this, I think this, and you're soon making good, bad, right, wrong, you'll never find wisdom. And you'll have a very hard time resolving it. Or you'll have to talk with each other and, and have conferences and uh, you know, bring complaints and go into stuff for decades, and maybe there'll be some improvement. Right thought. When you realize, this is a quote from Sansanin, you are the same as all beings, right thought appears. So as soon as we think you and me were not the same, then we, right thought isn't there. He said, right thought is before thinking, and it's fundamental way it arises is realizing we're one. <coughs> Saying it's easy. Doing it moment to moment is a whole nother story. It's like talking about swimming and actually getting thrown in a pool and swimming. <laughs> Learn to swim. Do it. Right speech. One little thing I want to say here. 
Buddha talked about four ways to help others. And I, if I didn't already talk about it, I'll probably talk about it under Mahayana Buddhism. But the second one is, well, very briefly, give, pe things, uh, give people things they want and need. Maybe I talked about this last time. Uh, second is, uh, uh, so, uh, a good speech, encouraging speech. Oh, I think I did talk about it to you guys, the, how this TV show went out and they asked these kids, what's the worst word you heard your mother say? And some say shit, and some say, you know, damn, and stuff like that. But I watched it. The, the one word that most kids said, the one word that got the most hits, stupid. Kids feel it's a bad word because they got called stupid or they heard their parents call somebody else stupid. Think about that. Right speech. Right action. Help. You know, uh, did you see the movie Bohemian Rhapsody about the queen and about Freddie Mercury? And it's a good movie, you know, it's a rock and roll movie and it's got a nice story and blah, blah, blah. And, but the part I like the best is he is from, I think, a Farsi family from India. He's born in England and they're very traditional and he's gay and he becomes a rock and roll star. And of course it flips out his parents. And by the end, he's not afraid of it anymore, uh, of them or of who he is or anything. And he goes to visit them with his lover. And he's going to go do this very uh, famous concert, Live Aid. I think it was the first concert that was done as a, uh, what do you call it, benefit to raise a lot of money for suffering people. In this case, I think it was for uh, starving people in, in Africa. And uh, he's there and he tells his parents, you know, I have to go now, we're going to do a concert. And he says, and nobody's, we're not getting any money for it. And he goes to leave and his father comes up to him and he looks at his father and he says, good thoughts, good words, good action, just what you taught me. And his father hugs him. You know, I'm sure his father is like, Everything this guy's doing is not what I want him to do. He's gay, he's a rock and roll star, all this stuff. But he completely has the values I tried to give to him as his father. Good thoughts, good words, good action. To me, that's the best part of the movie. It was like, wow, you know? Very nice. Uh, right livelihood. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> If you can, don't be a butcher, don't make weapons, and uh, whatever you do, you know, don't be an asshole. <laughs> Number, uh, next one, right effort, try. Try and fall down and try again, and fall down and try again. I was very happy when Sung San Sinim said, uh, Dharma means seven times fall down, eight times get up. I mean, his math is a little funny there, but I think that assumes that you start down on the ground. So you get up, that's one. Then you fall down and you get up, it's two. I mean, otherwise the math is kind of weird, you know. If you fall down seven times, why not get up seven times? But it's true, we start out on the ground. So maybe he counted the first time you stood up as one. That's before you fell down. So seven times fall down, eight times get up. That made me feel really good because you want to give up a lot, you know, but right effort. Get up and try again, you know. Uh, right mindfulness. Learn to pay attention. Just learn to pay attention and not be, you know, colored by your opinions. Then you won't see, you know. Only if you're clear you're going to say, West Coast people, many opinions, but they don't hold them strongly. East Coast people, not many opinions, but they hold them very strongly. Instead of just seeing that, you're going to make an opinion. And the opinion's based on whether you're East or West Coast. If you're East Coast, it's like, you know, why do they have so many opinions and they don't even believe in them? If you're West Coast, man, you guys are really you grab something and you won't let go. What's with you? Loosen up, you know? So get rid of your opinions, pay attention, right mindfulness appears. Right meditation or practice, 
Meditation, you know, it's not only sitting. We, we teach a bowing meditation, an enchanting meditation, driving your car meditation, being with your family meditation, going to work meditation, hanging out with your uh, friends meditation. When you're doing something, do it. Name is meditation. So those are the Eightfold Path. How are we doing time-wise? Ooh. I'm not going to talk much about the three marks or seals of existence. They're a little similar to um, the three insights. All things are impermanent. All dharmas are without self-nature. That means even dharmas has many meanings. It can mean things that appear, stuff. It, uh, you know, in the universe, it can also mean uh, law or truth. So all of that's impermanent, you know. Uh, it's without self-nature. It can't, it only arises from conditions and disappears. So you can't start grabbing onto, this is right, this is wrong. And very important, nirvana is perfect stillness. This is one point where, many points, but one point where uh, Christianity, for example, and Buddhism touch. Nirvana is perfect stillness. One of the sutras, Buddha says, all things in the universe are appearing and disappearing. That is the law of appearing and disappearing. When appearing and disappearing both disappear, that stillness is bliss. And in the Bible it says, be still, know that I am God. Same point. So uh, Sung Santin used to be invited particularly to Catholic monasteries in the United States, in Poland, possibly other places, and they could connect on that point. And then they would share how do they reach that? How can they actually become like that? Um, three kinds of practices in Hinayana Buddhism. Precepts, conduct, uh, concentration, meditation, and uh, insight or wisdom. In Theravadan Buddhism, they'll talk about precepts, uh, concentration, and insight. Uh, in Mahayana Buddhism, we talk about precepts, uh, uh, meditation, samadhi, samadhi. It means uh, one mind. And uh, prajna, wisdom. Uh, usually in Theravada Buddhism, they say insight in Mahayana, wisdom, okay? So those are the three practices. Behavior. If we follow certain behaviors, we get suffering. If we follow other behaviors, we are led in the path to uh, happiness. And if you're not sure, follow the signs, you know? The precepts aren't the goal, but they're the road signs pointing the way. So if you're not clear, follow them. Uh, concentration meditation is, uh, you know, if any of you have tried to sit, even for five minutes, you see, your mind so, goes all over the place. Can we, without getting into a huge fight with my uh, habit, my thinking habit, uh, begin to uh, focus? It's called training your mind. Training your mind. You know, all athletes work on that. They, they don't just necessarily naturally have it. Some are better than others, but they work on it. You know, if they're playing basketball and they're thinking about something else during a game, they're not going to be very sharp. So they work on it. Uh, I, I listen sometimes to classical music and watch these people play the violin or the piano. It's unbelievable. I don't know if they can do that in other parts of their lives, but they're tremendously ch trained in physical and mental attention and ability. You know, often they can't do it in other parts of their lives. We're trying to learn to bring that into everything in our life. We don't have to be the best father ever, the best monk ever, you know. We just have to be better than we are right now, if we can, at least try to. And uh, insight, you begin to see the way things really work, not my idea. And there is a way in which things work if we pay attention. 
and then we're mu going to be much more skillful in our approach to situations, in our speech and actions. We'll just be much more skillful if we're paying attention and we get insight to the way things are. Um, precepts or conduct helps us find the correct way. Concentration helps us attain truth. What is here now? What can we reflect? You know, I'll talk about this more under Mahayana. Not my idea, like I said with the sky. Sky's blue. Farmer wants rain, not so happy. Somebody wants a picnic, happy. If you get caught on that kind of your situation, your opinion, you lose truth. And in, in, in difficult situations, you won't be able to function in a way that even gets you what you want. Uh, and wisdom, insight, leads to correct life. How to live a life that actually is beneficial for myself and others. And you know, when we do that, we're very happy. And when we can't do that, our teaching is very simple. When we don't know how, only go straight, don't know. Instead of, you know, just making my opinion stronger. And it's easy to see if you look at the many conflicts around the world that it's a, a, a lot of people holding their opinion. And that's why in societies, in families, in our, inside ourselves, we can't uh, resolve these uh, uh, things and we create suffering. And even if your opinion wins, if it uh, can't take care of everybody, it will eventually bring suffering. Even to you, even if you're the winner, uh, you will get the suffering from it too. So uh, you, you've all you know, come into this class because you're either already practicing Buddhism or you're very interested in Buddhist teaching. And uh, so I hope uh, talking about uh, some of these things which uh, Zen Master Sung San taught us as the bone of Buddhism is helpful. And I am purposely uh, uh, not telling many of the stories that are in the collection because you can read that. Okay, so uh, that comes to the end of our discussion on uh, Hinayana Buddhism. And very briefly, again, the goal of Hinayana Buddhism is attain nirvana, stillness, going from something to nothing. Next, two weeks from now, we'll begin talking about Mahayana Buddhism, <clears throat> excuse me, and the, the, the bone of Mahayana Buddhism. And the simple version is from something, from nothing to something. Originally nothing, then what? And it's to find the Bodhisattva way. Rather than find extinction, it's to find the way to help all beings life after life. And uh, they both bring benefit. And uh, we're trying to give a broad sense in a very simple way of the great width and, and depth of Buddha's teaching. OK? So uh, next time, uh, we'll start talking more about Mahayana Buddhism. So now, um, if anybody has any questions, uh, they can send it in on the chat, and the monitor will uh, ask me the question and, and uh, announce it to all of you so that uh, uh, let's see what happens. Okay? Thank you. Uh, American dogs go woof woof. Uh, Korean dogs go mung mung. I heard Polish dogs go how how. And I think Japanese dogs go wang wang. Okay? That's a dog's barking. But actually, none of that is dog's barking. If you want true dog's barking, you have to ask a dog. Okay? So truth is not dependent on words. You have to realize that. You say she's got her truth. What does that mean? Now, her truth, what do you mean? You know, probably her or, or this other person's explanation for the situation. 
and you've got yours, so which one's the truth? It's not how it works. That's a, your idea. If your mind has no idea at all, you can also take care of the other person's idea. So truth also is before thinking. So we say, son never says, I am son. Human beings call me son. No. Cat never says, human beings, I am cat. Actually, uh, what is it? why would the cat tell Americans or English speaking, call me cat, but it seems that the, the cats in Korea are telling them koyangi. So, you know, what's going on here? You know, cat never says, I am cat, I am koyangi. No, truth is not dependent on words. If you even realize that point, you begin to uh, uh, perceive things differently. That's very important. So don't make my truth and their truth. You can digest their situation and even their point of view if you don't have any yourself. But that sounds like, oh, then what am I going to do? Everybody's going to take advantage of me. No. It's not. Truth is very simple, very clear. When you're hungry, eat. When somebody's hungry, give them food. You know? The sky's blue, tree's green. Just don't attach to the words and ideas, and you begin to experience truth. I uh, grew up in a big city in America that had a very old subway system. So even in the 50s, somehow it was old. And I remember taking the subway downtown a few times with my mother, maybe I was five. And when the train would come, in, it'd be in the tunnel, and then it would come into the station, which was also out underground. It was so loud, and it's like a monster. And all the kids were the same. We all cover our ears and we're scared, you know. It's just so pure reaction. Sound. Little kids are really affected by sound, you know. You know, little kids, they don't understand what you're saying. They're reacting to the sound of your voice. I like living in countries where I don't know the language. I mean, I don't want to walk down the street and hear all the bullshit that people talk to each other about all the time. So I can walk around and just watch their faces, listen to the sound of their voice. It's much more interesting. So uh, don't make, uh, you know, you have to get a different idea of what is truth. And practice will help you experience it. One time, quick, you go ahead, next, next. No true nature, so nothing to understand, so no problem. <laughs> uh, no, I got plenty of suffering. You know, my eyes uh, are bothering me from all day looking at the computer. I noticed during the sitting meditation tonight, my eyes were like... <laughs> <you know? laughs> I thought, oh, wow, that's what happens when you watch a computer all the time, you know. But... Uh, uh, Bodhidharma said, uh, the way is awareness. When we're not aware of things, we will have many problems. And, uh, and all we'll know is our opinion, and our opinion is very limited always. Even if you get a lot of support from others for your opinion, it, it doesn't mean that it's uh, uh, beneficial. Uh, yeah, sure, practicing helps, you know. And, uh, and very important, fall down seven times, get up eight times, because uh, um, you, you crash sometimes. I did, and I, and I luckily found a place to go when I crash. You know, I'm born in the tiger year, and I think tigers, maybe dogs and stuff, maybe many animals, when they're sick, they go someplace, and they kind of lay around by themselves, and then slowly they get better. I'm kind of like that. So um, I didn't go home. <laughs> when I had a hard time, I never went to my parents' house. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for you that will help, then please do it, okay? But definitely, I mean, uh, I am far happier now than I was, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, good choices, even big mistakes I made. Uh, one thing I loved about Buddhist practice is you can take something that's so bad that you've done and somehow 
if you really digest it, you can, it can become a positive thing. And I have instances, definite things in my life that have been like that, you know? So, uh, and it's just come from a try, try, try. Uh, so definitely uh, Buddha's teaching uh, works, but it's just like I said, swimming. You can read a book on swimming, but somebody throws you in a pool, it's not enough. You gotta get in the pool, slowly get better, have the teacher show you, move your head to the side and kick your legs and you get better, better, better and maybe one day you win the Olympics. And if you don't, who cares? You can swim when you need to and that's uh, also satisfying. So definitely helps, wonderful. Next. I don't think you're blessed in this life because you're spending a lot of time thinking about next life. What's so wonderful about that? <laughs> you better reevaluate your life right now. <laughs> what do you mean? You got food, you got clothes, you got a house. Maybe next life you won't have food, clothes, and a house, but you'll be happy. <laughs> you're not blessed now. You got a lot of thinking. What are you thinking about next life for? If you're really concerned about next life, practice and cut that thinking. Oh, what if, what if, what if? Everybody thinks that, and they will always ha have problems. In our, in our town, uh, you know, it, it's a military town. There's 50,000 people here. There's a lot of churches. There's a couple small Buddhist temples. We're actually the biggest Buddhist temple in our, oh no, the military base also has a big Buddhist temple, but we're the biggest temple that's not in the military base. And um, uh, now I gotta remember, why the hell am I talking about this? Ha ha, just went out. Maybe it'll come back. <laughs> there it goes. Maybe it went into the next life. <laughs> I'll remember it then. <laughs> okay, next question. I'll see if it comes back. <laughs> Trying to answer your question right now. <laughs> Come here and I'll show you. <laughs> One time we said to Sung San Tini, you know, you used to do, when you were young, so much formal practice and difficult eating and, and you know, these very difficult retreats. And it's like, you don't do that anymore. And he says, I do hard training. My, my hard training, my practice is uh, teaching my students. Hitting my students is my practice. That's what he said one time. <laughs> I like them all. It's great. You know, you got tools in your, in your pockets. You got tools. Give something to somebody, maybe that helps them. If that doesn't, maybe try some decent words. If that doesn't, maybe uh, talk about uh, the way things work. And if that doesn't, just do stuff together and uh, see. And uh, if circumstances bring it about, maybe one day they'll want to learn from you. They're all good, they're all useful. Which one do you like best? <laughs> what was I trying to say with that th thing about our temple? Oh, she said, it's gone already. Maybe I'm in the next life with you, <laughs> worried about what will happen. <laughs> okay, so there was another question that was sent to me. And it was from a woman named uh, Sorcha. I, I hope I pronounced it right. And it was basically about injustice. Uh, she said, when we see some things that we know are wrong and unjust, uh, what can we do about it? And uh, you know, she was talking particularly about work and, and a boss. She didn't describe the details, but she said, oh, maybe I have some idea about equality that's causing a problem, and how can I help my daughter relate to the things that are happening in her country, you know, some issues, major issues that are affecting the daughter's uh, mind. Um, first of all, if you want wisdom, like what really helps, 
take away ideas of good and bad, right and wrong. And that's not easy because we have very strong ideas about that. Many people do, most people do. Um, but if you look at yourself, you know, my opinion makes me think this is right, this is wrong, justice, injustice, you know. And these are, these are uh, it's a very good question because we know in our societies there's a serious issues. Uh, you know, I'm American, look at America, there's very many serious issues, how people treat each other, how they have treated each other. But if we have these ideas of good and bad, right and wrong, we're already doing opposites thinking. And the other side will have their version of it. You know, it occurred to me that uh, many people, uh, people I'm close to, they worry very much in America that uh, the president and the people who support him are destroying the country. And they're very, very concerned. Maybe they're afraid or they're angry or they want to do something about it. But it's important to understand the other side felt the same way when Obama was president. They also thought it's the end of our country. If we line up the arguments, then, well, if I think this way, then I'll think they're nuts. But if they think that way, then they'll think I'm nuts. And that's what's happening. If you connect on the basis of these, just these ideas of good and bad, right and wrong, justice and injustice, very hard. You need people who really have wisdom, who can connect with the other side somewhere deep, perhaps through emotion. And then there's a chance, if you can connect with the common humanity and realize they may be feeling exactly the same thing from the other side, and don't get into who's justified, who's not, you can connect then something can change. And great people know how to do that. You know, Martin Luther King could to an extent, of course he got killed for it, but there were a lot of people, both black and white, who uh, he woke up and who are energized and who continue to do things and still do. You know, somebody like that. Uh, this. Uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice who just uh, died. She has a very clear point of view about things. She was definitely pro-choice, that uh, abortion should be available and the individual should decide. And she didn't argue about it on a religious way. She said it is the right of a citizen of America to be able to pursue happiness. And I don't know, she had a very clear argument. There was another great justice, Thurgood Marshall, who was the first black justice put on the Supreme Court. And he worked for 30 years being a civil rights lawyer in situations where black people were being killed. You know? And he found a way to communicate with others that produce changes not by thinking of, yeah, you have your, this is unjust, but if you don't know how to connect with the person, you're not gonna get a change. It's not gonna happen. You have to connect with the person. If you're a boss, you have to communicate in, with him in a way that acknowledges his, him as a boss. One thing that Sun Sansini was amazing at doing is giving you the feeling that he's on your side. And for those who could catch that, he could yell at. He could even hit some students physically. One time I came back from a 49-day retreat as a layperson. I had let my hair grow, my beard grew, and something was always telling people to cut off their beards. Oh, your face more clear. I came back, bowed to him and said hi. He asked me about the retreat. And then he said, oh, this beard, very good. You keep this beard. Now, no checking face. So, OK, cool, why not? You know, so I kept the beard. For, he even told me how to cut it a little bit <laughs> to make it look better. I don't know. 
<laughs> I don't know. But in any case, I kept it. And then there was a day when he was going to make this new category of lay people who were a little more serious, and they're going to make their hair really short and stuff like that. And I decided at that time, I'm not going to do that. I'm either going to become a full monk or I'm not changing anything. And I went to him and I said something not cool. And he grabbed this beard and gave me this nasty look. And he said, oh, I know what happened. He was saying, why you not do this? Why are you holding something? And I said, holding? I gave the Zen Center some money. Ooh. <laughs> he grabbed it. You gave? He said it like, the, like I'd put shit in his mouth. You know, he said, you gave? And he shoved my face in the ground, you know, and kind of shoved it around and stuff. I remember in his bedroom. And I knew immediately, he's right. That's not, that's not the Diamond Sutra. There's no giver. There's no one you're giving to, and there's no gift. That's correct giving. I gave. I was even surprised in myself. I never thought that before. But suddenly, I gave, and he goes, <laughs> so I went and shaved the beard off, so when I not made another mistake, he couldn't grab it. But when I became a monk, very funny, he told me, yeah, you always shave here, but grow here no problem. <laughs> so I decided I'm not giving him anything more to grab onto. <laughs> So first, if you want to really get wisdom of how to deal with those situations with your parents, with your children, with your workers, with your boss, with your coworker, you have to connect. If you are holding your ideas of what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, you won't be able to connect. It doesn't mean, because you say your boss, that it means you're going to do everything they say, but you, you know, if he's the boss, he has certain responsibilities. Even if he's lousy, then talk to his boss. It's not, it's not your job to fire him, you know? But if you really, if you really get wisdom, you can make a change. I'll give you an example. Uh, Sung Santinim had a, uh, oh, I gotta watch the time. Oh, I got a few minutes. He had a student in America, uh, New Haven, Connecticut, who was a medical doctor. And he uh, practiced, he came almost every day to the Zen Center, and he had a family. He had a five-year-old, and then he had a little girl. And he came one day because he, he said he realized that he and his wife realized that their boy doesn't like the girl. And when they're not around, he hits her. So he said, what can I do? And Santinim had a really good idea. <laughs> I don't know where he got this, but he said, you take the son into another room, and you say, you don't like this little girl, do you? I also don't like her, but mommy likes her. So if we got to, if you and I work together, we can make mommy happy, then no problem. And this girl will not be a problem, okay? So you and I be good to this girl, mommy's really happy and she'll love us more. And the guy said it worked. Now where did Sansanim come up with that? I don't know. <laughs> So maybe if you keep a big question, if you look at your situation, you a little bit understand this boss. If you understand, no matter what, whether a person's good or bad, boss is boss, worker is worker, there is a relationship. It doesn't mean you have to be under their criminal behavior, but it can, if, you, if you can accept that, you might be able to figure out how to connect and to change that person's mind. Most people want to be accepted. They just have very weird, and occasionally, look at the American president. He's insane about acceptance, but he has a very destructive, nasty, and divisive way of going about it. Most people want to be accepted. And if you find out how to connect with the person that way, you can have an influence on them. Very important. Also, you have to understand you're in that situation. It's also your karma. Now, some karma doesn't change easily. You know, the Tibetans say there's two kinds of demons. One demon comes and bothers you, but if you don't give it any energy, it'll go away. The other kind of demon will come and keep bothering you no matter what you do. That, the only way to get rid of that demon is you have to change some karma inside. So, uh, just some more information. How do you change karma? Practice. 
Do an hour keto every day, you know? Do an hour of chanting, and you'll be thinking about your boss and how unfair it is and how unfair it is, and you'll be trying to just quantum bolso, quantum bolso, quantum bolso, quantum bolso, and you'll be thinking about the boss, and one day something will happen. Who knows what? You'll get sick of all the thinking. Something new will pop up, and that will probably have more wisdom. Don't wait. Don't look. Just try and chant, and when you're doing something, just do it. Your thought, <coughs> your thought energy, your emotion energy into the sound. Don't be, oh, blah, blah, blah. not like that. Just take the energy and purely make the sound, quantum, bolso, quant, your energy into the sound and hear your voice. That's a concentration, meditation. And by itself, these opinions, something it can dissolve and change. And then sometimes you get wisdom. About how to, you understand something you didn't understand before. You can also take care of somebody else's opinion, and that will change them by itself. So it's not easy because there's a lot of things if we have a certain we feel that's unjust. All that means is take away just and unjust, but don't lose the energy of practice and trying, and then you'll find a way to. Do something, say something, or do nothing, say nothing. It will change the situation. And sometimes it will change without you doing anything. That's the power of the mind, uh, mind practice, of our practice. So um, be very aware of the opposite thinking, everybody, that appears in your mind. That's the first sign that my view is incomplete. It doesn't mean, oh, I can't do anything. I just have to suffer here. No. But if your mind doesn't get... Uh, more clear, uh, you're not going to produce a very good result. Pretty much. You may win, but uh, you won't have changed the karma. It'll just come back eventually. But if you practice, things do change. And uh, often in a, in a beneficial way. Okay. So uh, today uh, we've done uh, the last part in our quick survey of uh, important teachings in Hinayana Buddhism and uh, answered some questions. And uh, I hope that if you have the book, you read it and, uh, uh, you know, uh, chew on it. Chew on things that strike you. And then next, uh, two weeks from now, we'll continue. And uh, if you have questions, bring them with you. Or if questions appear, uh, during class, then you can bring them up. And so I just want to say thank you to everybody. Uh, thank you to the translators. I don't know how you kept up with me, or if you could, but uh, uh, I'm sure that everybody who listened to you got enlightenment, <laughs> even if they don't realize it. So <laughs> let's, try, let's all of us try, 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 and then we'll be able to continue to help ourselves, help our families, help our countries, help this uh, whole uh, world. So thank you very much. Sentient beings are numberless. We vow to save them all. Delusions are endless. We vow to cut through them all. The teachings are infinite. We vow to learn them all. The Buddha way is inconceivable. We vow to attain it. Bye-bye. And good luck.